fits. Yes, give him fits. That's the very word pitch fits into him. Merrily, merrily, hearts alive. Putting for supper. You know, Mary's the word. Pull, babes, pull. Sucklings, pull. All. But what the devil are you hurrying about? Softly, softly, and steadily, my men. Only pull, and keep pulling. Nothing more. Crack all your backbones, and bite your knives in two, that's all. Take it easy, why don't ye take it easy? I say, and burst all your livers and lungs, but what it was that inscrutable I have said to that tigger yellow crew of his, these were words best omitted here. Only the infidel sharks in the audacious seas may give ear to such words when, with tornado brow, and eyes of red murder, and foam-glued lips, I have leaked after. Meanwhile, all the boats tore on. The repeated specific allusions of Flask to that whale, as he called the fictitious monster which he declared to be incessantly tantalizing his boat's bow with its tail, these allusions of his were at times so, but this was against all rule. For the oarsmen must put out their eyes, and ram a skewer through their necks, usage pronouncing that they must have no organs but ears. It was a sight full of quick wonder. The vast swells of the omnipotent sea, the surge of not the raw recruit, marching from the bosom of his wife into the fever heat of his first battle, not the dead man's ghost encountering the first unknown phantom in the other world, neither the dancing white water made by the chase was now becoming more and more visible, owing to the increasing darkness of the dun-cloud shadows flung upon the sea. The jets of vapor no longer blended, but tilted everywhere to right and left. The whales seemed separating their wakes. The boats were pulled more apart, Starbuck giving chase to three whales running dead to leeward. Our sail was now set, and with the still rising wind, we rushed along, the boat going with such madness through the water that the lee oars could scarcely be. Soon we were running through a suffusing wide veil of mist, neither ship nor boat to be seen. Give way, men, whispered Starbuck, drawing still further aft the sheet of his sail. There is time to kill a fish yet before the squall comes. There's white water again, close to spring. Soon after, two cries in quick succession on each side of us denoted that the other boats had got fast, but hardly were they overheard, though not one of the oarsmen was then facing the life and death peril so close to them ahead. Yet, with their eyes on the intense countenance of the mate in the stern of the boat, they knew that the imminent instant, meanwhile the boat was still booming through the mist, the waves curling and hissing around us like the erected crests of enraged serpents. That's his hump. There, there, give it to him, whispered Starbuck. A short rushing sound leaped out of the boat. It was the darted iron of Queequeg. Then all in one welded commotion came an invisible push from Astern, while forward the boat seemed striking on a ledge. The sail collapsed and exploded. A gush of scalding vapor. The whole crew were half suffocated as they were tossed helter-skelter into the white curdling cream of the squall. Squall, whale, and harpoon had all blended together, and the whale, merely grazed by the iron, escaped. Though completely swamped, the boat was nearly unharmed. Swimming round it, we picked up the floating oars, and lashing them across the gunwale, tumbled back to our places. There we sat up to our knees in the sea, the water covering every rib and plank so that to our downward-gazing eyes the suspended craft seemed a coral boat grown up to us from the bottom of the earth. The wind increased to a howl. The waves dashed their bucklers together. The whole squall roared, forked, and crackled around us like a white fire upon the prairie. Meanwhile the driving scud, rack, and mist grew darker with the shadows of night. No sign of the ship could be seen. The rising sea forbade all attempts to bail out the boat. The oars were useless as propellers, performing now the office of life preservers. So, cutting the lashing of the waterproof match keg, after many failures, Starbuck contrived to ignite the lamp in the lantern. Then stretching it on a waif pole, 
there then he sat holding up that imbecile candle in the heart of that almighty forlornness there then he sat the sign and symbol of a man without faith hopelessly holding up hope in the midst of despair wet drenched through and shivering cold despairing of ship or boat we lifted up our eyes as the dawn came on the mist still spread over the sea the empty lantern lay crushed in the bottom of the boat suddenly queequeg started to his feet hollowing his hand to his ear we all heard a faint creaking as of ropes and yards hitherto muffled by the storm the sound came nearer and nearer the thick mists were dimly parted by a huge vague form affrighted we all sprang into the sea as the ship at last loomed into view bearing right down upon us within a distance of not much more than its length floating on the waves we saw the abandoned boat as for one instant it tossed and gaped beneath the ship's bows like a chip at the base of a cataract and then the vast hull rolled over it again we swam for it were dashed against it by the seas and were at last taken up and safely landed on board ere the squall came close to the other boats had cut loose from their fish and returned to the ship in good time the ship had given us up but was still cruising if haply it might light upon some token of our perishing an oar or a lance pole chapter forty nine the hyena there are certain queer times and occasions in this strange mixed affair we call life when a man takes this whole universe for a vast practical joke though the wit thereof he but dimly discerns and more however nothing dispirits and nothing seems worth while disputing he bolts down all events all creeds and beliefs and persuasions all hard things visible and invisible never mind how nobby as an ostrich of and as for small difficulties and worryings prospects of sudden disaster peril of life and limb all these and death itself seem to him only sly that odd sort of wayward mood i am speaking of comes over a man only in some time of extreme tribulation it comes in the very midst of his earnestness so that what just before might have seen there is nothing like the perils of wailing to breed this free and easy sort of genial desperado philosophy and with it i now regarded this whole voyage of the peckwood and the great white queequeg said i when they had dragged me the last man to the deck and i was still shaking myself in my jacket to fling off the water queequeg my fine friend mr 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 stub said i turning to that worthy who buttoned up in his or jacket was now calmly smoking his pipe in the rain mr stub i think i have heard you say that of all whalemen you ever met our chief mate mr starbuck is by far the most careful and prudent i suppose then that going plump on a flying whale with your sail set in a foggy squall is the height of a whaleman's discretion certain i've lowered for whales from a leaking ship in a gale off cape horn mr flask said i turning to little king post who was standing close by you are experienced in these things and i am not will you tell me whether it is an unalterable law in this fishery mr flask for an oarsman to break his own back pulling himself back foremost into death's jaws can't you twist that smaller said flask yes that's the law i should like to see a boat's crew backing water up to a whale face foremost and hey the whale would give them squint for squint mind that here then from three impartial witnesses i had a deliberate statement of the entire case considering therefore that squalls and capsizings in the water consequent bivouac queequeg said i come along you shall be my lawyer executor and legate it may seem strange that of all men sailors should be tinkering at their last this was the fourth time in my nautical life that i had done the same thing after the ceremony was concluded upon the present occasion 
I felt all the easier. A stone was rolled away from my heart. Besides, all the days I should now live would be as good as the days that Lazarus lived after his resurrection. A supplementary clean gain of so many months, or weeks as the case might I survived myself. My death and burial were locked up in my chest. I looked round me tranquilly and contentedly, like a quiet ghost with a clean conscience sitting inside the bars of a snug family vault. Now then, thought I, unconsciously rolling up the sleeves of my frock, here goes for a cool, collected dive at death and destruction, and the devil fetched Chapter 50 Ahab's Boat and Crew Fidala, who would have thought it flask, cried Stubb. If I had but one leg, you would not catch me in a boat, unless maybe to stop the plug hole with my timber toe. Oh, he's a wonderful old man. I don't think it's so strange, after all. On that account, said Flask, if his leg were off at the hip, now it would be a different thing. That would disable him. But he has one knee, and good part of the other left. You know I don't know that, my little man. I never yet saw him kneel. Among whale-wise people it has often... So Tamerlane's soldiers often argued with tears in their eyes whether that invaluable life of his ought to be carried into the thickest of the fight. But with Ahab the question assumed a modified aspect. Considering that with two legs man is but a hobbling white in all times of danger, considering that the pursuit of whales is always under great and extraordinary difficulties, that every individual Ahab well knew that although his friends at home would think little of his entering a boat in certain comparatively harmless vicissitudes of the chase, for the sake of being near the scene of action and giving his... Therefore he had not solicited a boat's crew from them, nor had he in any way hinted his desires on that head. Nevertheless he had taken private measures of his own touching all that matter. Until Kev... Habakkuk seven Pablo's is this... But almost everybody supposed that this particular preparative heedfulness in Ahab must only be with a view to the ultimate chase of Moby Dick, for he had already revealed his intention to hunt that mortal mark, but such a supposition did by no means involve the remotest suspicion as to any boat's crew being assigned to that boat. Now, with the subordinate phantoms, what wonder remained soon waned away, for in a whaler wonders soon wane. Besides, now and then such unaccountable odds and ends of strange nations come up from the unknown nooks and ash holes of the earth to man these floating outlaws of whalers. But be all this as it may, certain it is that while the subordinate phantoms soon found their place among the crew, though still as it were somehow distinct from them, yet that hair turbaned Fidala remained a muff whence he came in a mannerly world like this, by what sort of unaccountable tie he soon evinced himself to be linked with Ahab's peculiar fortunes. Nay, so far as to... But one cannot sustain an indifferent air concerning Fidala. He was such a creature as civilized, domestic people in the temperate zone only see in their dreams, and that but dimly, but the like of whom now... This, uh, since, since... Chapter 51 The Spirit Spout Days... Weeks passed, and under easy sail, the Ivory Peckwood had slowly swept across for several cruising grounds, that off the Azores, off Helena. It was while gliding through these latter waters that one serene and moonlight night, when all the waves rolled by like scrolls of silver, and by their soft, suffusing sea things, lit up by the moon, it looked celestial seemed some plumed and glittering god uprising from the sea. Fidala first described this jet. For of these moonlight nights, it was his wont to mount to the mainmast head and stand a lookout there with the same precision as if it had been day. And yet, though herds of whales were seen by night, not one whaleman in a hundred would venture a lowering for them. You may think with what emotions, then, the seamen beheld this old oriental perched aloft at such unusual hours. His turban and the moon, companions in war. But when, 
after spending his uniform interval there for several successive nights without uttering a single sound, when, after all this silence, his unearthly voice was heard and there she blows, had the trump of judgment blown, they could not have quivered more, yet still they felt no terror, rather pleasure. For though it was a most unwanted hour, yet so impressive was the cry, and so deliriously exciting that almost every soul on board instinctively desired a lowering. Walking the deck with quick, side-lunging strides, I have commanded the t'gallant sails and royals to be set, and every stunsail spread. The best man in the ship must take the helm. Then, with every masthead manned, the piled-up craft rolled down before the wind. The strange a thieving, lifting tendency of the taffrail breeze filling the hollows of so many sails, made the buoyant, hovering deck to feel high air, and had you watched a hab's face that night, you would have thought that in him also two different things were warring. While his one live leg made lively a chose along the deck, every stroke of his dead limb sounded like a coffin tap. On life and death this old man walked, but though the ship so swiftly sped, and though from every eye, like a rose, the eager glances shot, yet the silvery jet was no more seen that night. Every sailor swore he saw it once, but not a second time. This midnight spout had almost grown a forgotten thing, when, some days after, lo, at the same silent hour, it was again announced. Again it was described, and so it served us night after night, till no one heeded it but to wonder at it. Mysteriously jetted into the clear moonlight, or starlight, as the case might be, disappearing again for one whole day, or two days, or three. And somehow see, nor with the immemorial superstition of their race, and in accordance with the preternaturalness, as it seemed, which in many things invested the Pickwood, were there wanting some of the seamen who swore. For a time, there reigned, too, a sense of peculiar dread at this flitting apparition, as if it were treacherously beckoning us on and on, in order that the monster might turn round. These temporary apprehensions, so vague but so awful, derived a wondrous potency from the contrasting serenity of the weather, in which, beneath all its blue blandness, but, at last, when turning to the eastward, the cape winds began howling around us and we rose and fell upon the long, troubled seas that are there, when the Ivoritas picked close to our bows. Strange forms in the water darted hither and thither before us, while thick in our rear flew the inscrutable sea ravens. And every morning, perched on our stays, rows of these birds were seen, and spite of our hootings, for a long time obstinately clung to the hemp, as though they deemed and heaved and heaved, still unrestingly heaved the black sea, as if its vast tides were a conscience, and the great mundane soul were in anguish and remorse for the long sin and cape of good hope, do they call ye, rather cape tormentoso, as called of yore, for long allured by the perfidious silences that before had attended us, we but calm, snow-white, and unvarying, still directing its fountain of feathers to the sky, still beckoning us on from before, the solitary jet would at times, during all this blackness of the elements, Ahab, though assuming for the time the almost continual command of the drenched and dangerous deck, manifested the gloomiest reserve, and more in tempestuous times like these, after everything above and aloft has been secured, nothing more can be done but passively to await the issue of the gale then captain and crew become practical fatalists. So, with his every leg inserted into its accustomed hole, and with one hand firmly grasping a shroud, a half for hours and hours would stand gazing dead to windward. Meantime, the crew driven from the forward part of the ship by the perilous seas that burstingly broke over its bows, stood in a line along the bulwarks in the waist. And the better, few or no words were spoken, and the silent ship, as if manned by painted sailors in wax, day after day tore on through all the swift madness and gladness of the demoniac wave. 
By night the same muteness of humanity before the shrieks of the ocean prevailed. Still in silence the men swung in the bowlines, still wordless Ahab stood up to the blast. Even when wearied nature seemed demanding repose, he would not seek that repose in his hammock. Never could Starbuck forget the old man's aspect, when one night going down into the cabin to mark how the barometer stood, he saw him with closed eyes sitting straight in his floor-screwed chair. On the table beside him lay unrolled one of those charts of tides and currents which have previously been spoken of. His lantern swung from his tightly clenched hand. Though the body was erect, the head was thrown back so that the closed eyes were pointed towards the needle of the tell-tale that swung from a beam in the ceiling. The cabin compass is called the tell-tale. Terrible old man, thought Starbuck with a shudder, sleeping in this gale, still thou steadfastly iest thy purpose. Chapter 52 The Albatross Southeastward from the Cape, off the distant Crozets, a good cruising ground for right whalemen, a sail loomed ahead, the Ghani, Albatros, by name. As she slowly drew nigh, from my lofty perch at the foremast head, I had a good view of that sight so remarkable to a tyro in the far ocean fisheries, a whaler at sea, and long abs as if the waves had been fullers. This craft was bleached like the skeleton of a stranded walrus. All down her sides, this spectral appearance was traced with long channels of reddened rust, while all her spars and her rigging were like the thick branches of trees furred over with hoar-frost. Only her lower sails were set. A wild sight it was to see her long birded lookouts at those three mast heads. They seemed clad in the skins of beasts, so torn and bepatched the raiment that had survived nearly four years of cruising. Standing in iron hoops nailed to the mast, they swayed and swung over a fathomless sea. And though, when the ship slowly glided close under our stern, we six men, ship ahoy, have ye seen the white whale? But as the strange captain, leaning over the pallid bulwarks, was in the act of putting his trumpet to his mouth, it somehow fell from his hand. Meantime his ship was still increasing the distance between. While in various silent ways the seamen of the Peckwood were evincing their observance of this ominous incident, at the first mere mention of the white whale's name to another ship, a hab for a moment paw, but taking advantage of his windward position, he again seized his trumpet, and knowing by her aspect that the stranger vessel, though in the course of his continual voyagings, a hab must often before have noticed a similar sight, yet to any monomaniac man, the veriest trifles capriciously carry meanings. Swim away from me, do ye, murmured Ahab, gazing over into the water. There seemed but little in the words, but the tone conveyed more of deep helpless sadness than the insane old man had ever before evinced. But turning to the steersman, who thus far had been holding the ship in the wind to diminish her headway, he cried out in his old lion voice, Up helm, keep her off round the world. Were this world an endless plain? and by sailing eastward we could forever reach new distances, and discover sights more sweet and strange than any Cyclades or Islands of King Solomon. But in pursuit of those far mysteries we dream of, or in tormented chase of that demon phantom that some time or other swims before all human hearts, while chasing such over this r Chapter 53 The Gam the ostensible reason why Ahab did not go on board of the whaler we had spoken was this. The wind and sea betokened storms. But even had this not been the case, he would not after all, perhaps, have boarded her judging by his subsequent conduct on similar occasions, if so it had been that, by the process, for, as it eventually turned out, he cared not to consort, even for five minutes, with any stranger captain except he could contribute some of that information he so absorbingly sought. But all this might remain inadequately estimated, were not something said here of the peculiar usages of whaling vessels when meeting each other in foreign seas, and especially on a common crew. If two strangers crossing the Pine Barrens in New York State, or the equally desolate Salisbury Plain in England, if casually encountering each other in such an hospital, 
and especially would this seem to be a matter of course in the case of vessels owned in one seaport and whose captains officers and not a few of the men are personally known to each for the long absent ship the outward bounder perhaps has letters on board at any rate she will be sure to let her have some papers of a date a year or two later than the last and in return for that courtesy the outward bound ship would receive the latest whaling intelligence from the cruising ground to which she may be destined a thing of the utmost importance to her and in degree all this will hold true concerning whaling vessels crossing each other's track on the cruising ground itself even though they are equally long absent from home for one of them may have received a transfer of letters from some third and now far remote vessel and some of those letters may be for the people of the ship she now meets besides they would exchange the whaling news and have an agreeable chat for not only would they meet with all the sympathies of sailors but likewise with all the peculiar congenialities arising from a common pursuit and mutually shared privations and perils nor would difference of country make any very essential difference that is so long as both parties speak one language as is the case with americans and english though to be sure from the small number of english whalers such meetings do not very often occur and when they do occur there is too apt to be a sort of shyness between them besides the english whalers sometimes affect a kind of metropolitan superiority over the american whalers regarding the long lean nantucketer with his nondescript but where this superiority in the english whaleman does really consist it would be hard to say seeing that the yankees in one day collectively kill more whales than all the english but this is a harmless little foible in the English whale hunters, which the Nantucketer does not take much to heart, probably, because he knows that he has a few foibles himself. So we see that of all ships. Then, we separately sailing the sea, the whalers have most reason to be sociable, and they are so. Whereas, some merchant ships crossing each other's wake in the mid-Atlantic, will oftentimes pass on without so much as a single word of recognition, mutually cutting each other on the high sea. As for men of war, when they chance to meet at sea, they first go through such a string of silly bowings and scrapings, such a ducking of ensigns, that there does not seem to be much right down. As touching slave ships meeting, why, they are in such a prodigious hurry, they run away from each other as soon as possible. And as for pirates, when they chance to cross each other's crossbones, the first hail is how many skulls, the same way that whalers hail how many barrels, and that question once and but look at the godly, honest, unostentatious, hospitable, sociable, free and easy whaler, what does the whaler do when she meets another whaler in any sort of deep? Why it is that all merchant seamen, and also all pirates and man of war's men, and slave ship sailors cherish such a scornful feeling towards whale ships because in the case of pirates say i should like to know whether that profession of theirs has any peculiar glory about it it sometimes ends in uncommon elevation indeed but only at the gallows and besides when a man is elevated in that odd fashion he has no proper foundation for his superior altitude Hence I conclude that in boasting himself to be high lifted above a whaleman, in that assertion the pirate has no solid basis to stand on. But what is a gam? You might wear out your index finger running up and down the columns of dictionaries and never find the word. Doctor, 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 Johnson never attained to that erudition. No Webster's Ark does not hold it. Nevertheless, this same expressive word has now for many years been in constant use among some 15,000 true-born Yankees. Certainly, it needs a definition, and should be incorporated into the lexicon. With that view, let me learnedly define it. Gam. Noun a social meeting of two, or more, whale ships generally on a cruising ground, where after exchanging hails, 
they exchange visits. All professions have their own little peculiarities of detail. So has the whale fishery. In a pirate, man of war, or slave ship, when the captain is rowed anywhere in his boat, he always sits in the stern sheets on a comfortable, sometimes cushioned seat there, but the whale boat has no seat astern, no sofa of that sort whatever, and no tiller at all.